boldly and faithfully declare that this is the year of production. John 20, establishes a biblical standard that shall set the tone for this year. This year, the gifts and abilities that God placed in me will manifest like never before. I am committed to a life that will acknowledge my position and therefore I will not entertain negative thoughts, negative speech, or negative people. I am redeemed by the blood of Christ and nothing or no one can stop me. I believe that God has appointments and assignments for me that are specific and personal. What God has for me is for me. I must control my emotions and be ruled by the spirit and not my flesh. This is the year that God will affirm promises in my life. I cannot allow any person or spirit to cause me to doubt my identity. God is a promise keeper, and this is my year to fully receive all he has prepared for me. Everything that I have survived had a purpose for my destiny. God makes no mistakes, so everything works for my good. Favor operates in my life, causing doors to open for me that no one can prevent or slow down. I recognize and declare that God will accelerate performance in every area of my life. The presence of God in my life will produce new ideas, new inventions, and new innovations that will change the world. I will recognize and use gifts and talents that God has given me to prosper my church and community. I fully accept the mantle that God has placed on my life. I am a leader and a world changer. Because I believe that God has assigned promotions for me, I declare that I must be a doer of the word and not just a hearer. I have proven to God that he can trust me. My giving is evidence of my faith and a public record of my heart. As I am promoted, my giving will prove that I am a steward of what God provides. I will be blessed to become a greater blessing. God has called me to be a lender, therefore I will become debt free. There will be no lack in any area of my life. I believe this season of production will rest upon me, my church family, and my spiritual leadership in Jesus' name.
Moses. Jesus, Jesus, there is something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, all of heaven and the earth proclaim kings and kingdoms listen they will all pass away but there's something about that name Jesus Jesus Jesus, there is something about that name. I call him Master, my Savior, Jesus, all of heaven. The earth shall proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away, everybody. But there's something about. Let's do that again. But there's something. something but it's something about that hallelujah come on and bless God as the pastor comes give him glory give him honor come on he's worthy hallelujah he's worthy hallelujah he's worthy come on and bless him come on I said bless him he's better than that he's better than that Hallelujah! Bless him! Glory to your name, Jesus! We give you glory, God! Hallelujah, Jesus! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Can we just stay right there? Keep celebrating God for what he is doing, for what he has been doing, what he has been doing over this week, what he has been doing over these past few years. There is no name greater than his name.
what God wants to do in our lives. And can we just take a moment to say thank you that I'm still called according to your purpose. That you are still working things out in my life. We are not people without hope. We are not like the world. We have a savior. We have a protector. We have a king who never loses, regardless of what we feel like and regardless of what it looks like. He never loses. Hallelujah. 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 I gave you enough strength to muscle up the confidence and the courage to come to worship this morning. Don't think by far it was you. I gave you the breath and the energy and the strength to get here. See, we miss him. And he's saying, I'm reaching. But the problem is, we want God to do everything. We want him to come to our residence. He says, no, I want you to come here to the altar. But you got to crawl here. Can you imagine somebody crawling to get to his presence? And we leave. Not that God didn't want to do something. It's just that you didn't have the faith to believe that what I'm saying and what I'm doing is really what it is. Can I just help us today? <laughs> After the pandemic, when we came back into this church, God said, he told me specifically, he said, when you come back, it will be God. And God will be king. And so some stuff ain't going to look like what church used to look like. And some stuff we ain't got no blueprint for. And some stuff God going to do is just going to interrupt and we going to look like what in the world is going on. But God wants to be king. And we say it. He the king of kings. He the Lord of lords. We say it. But what the king says do, people do. And so we hear what the king says do, we gonna do. And God is saying this is a moment. This altar call is a moment for people who have been carrying something. Because guess what? Pastor Carl says it all the time. What happens in the spiritual, you see manifested in the natural. And what you see happening in the natural, you can understand that it's something going on in the spirit. And we see death all around us. And God says some people are carrying things that need to die. Mm. And the altar is a place of sacrifice where animals come to die. And whatever you are carrying, and only you know, something in you, something you're struggling with, something you're wrestling with that you know needs to die, God is saying to you right now, this altar call is for you, for what needs to die in your life, for what's not like me, for what is not going to serve you in the next chapter of your life. It has to die. Mm -hmm on the altar 
as a sign to God that I am freely giving it. You ain't got to take it from me. You ain't got to make life hard for me, for me to realize that it has to go. That bad thinking, it has to go. I'm bringing it to the altar, it has to go. That spirit that's in me that's not like you, that has to go. That lying spirit, that murderous spirit, it has to go. Because it's keeping me from you. It's keeping you from doing in me what you want to do in me. It has to die. And I'm bringing it to you, God. You don't have to strong on me no more. I'm bringing it to you. That security, those things that we built for security. Because I ain't going to let nobody hurt me no more. And I ain't going to let them do that to me no more. I ain't going to feel this way no more. I'm not going to serve no more. And God says that's keeping me from you. It's blocking the flow. Bring it. The song says, if you provide the fire, I'll provide the sacrifice. So God, we are offering the sacrifice today. We are offering you everything that we are tired of carrying. Because it is weighing us down, God. The hurt, the pain, the guilt, the condemnation, the grief that we've not been able to deal with. We bring it today, God. We bring it to your altar today, God. We bring it, God, as a sacrifice. As your children, God. Your word says to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. We know that this moment, God, we want to be acceptable to you. We don't want you to keep passing us by when we look at other people getting what we thought we should get and having what we thought we should have. God, we want to clear the airway today that nothing separates us from you, that nothing keeps your spirit from filling us, that nothing keeps your spirit from resting on us. God, we see what the condition of the world is and we want to be an answer. And we can't be an answer carrying what we've been carrying and doing the things that we've been doing. So God, today, we ask you on this altar to burn it up. What's not like you, burn it up. We freely give it to you today. Burn it up, God and scatter the ashes that we can't even return to it no more. That we can't pick it up when we leave here, God. God, I pray for every person standing at this altar. God, that you will meet the needs in their lives. God, that you will make yourself tangible to them. That they will see you. That they will feel you that they will hear you speaking to them and that they will know that it is your voice. They won't have to question anymore, is this me or is this God? Sharpen their discernment, God. Quiet the voices that are not like you, that are not of you. And God, I know we don't like it, but remove people from our lives that don't serve us. Remove everyone that we're trying to hold on to because they got us this far in the journey. But God, if they're not for the next leg, get them out. Clear our spaces, God. Clear our hearts, God. Clear our minds, God. That we can walk in our purpose. That we can walk in our call. God, that we are no longer just passive people but we are believers walking in the authority that you've given us. That we know that we are heirs. 
and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. That the same power that rested in him and on him, that you want to rest that on us, that you want to deposit that in us, and that you've already done it. God, we receive that today. We receive that today. God, bring back to our remembrance everything that we need to lay down. God, we're not going to waste this moment. And we're not going to let the enemy rob us of this moment by causing us to forget things that we need to lay down. So whatever you need to say to God, go ahead and say it to him now. Tell your king what it is that you need. God, we've seen so many times in your word where people have come to the king for an anthem, come to the king for a decision, come to the king for what they need, God. And we know that we have an open heaven now before our king. So say what it is you need to say to your king today. What do you need God to take today? Tell your king. Holy Spirit, re reveal everything to us now at this altar. Every thought, every deed, every person, every decision. Empty us now, God. Empty us now, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. And as he has, as you emptied yourself, come on and celebrate God. Come on and celebrate what he's doing in your life. Come on and celebrate. Give him glory. Give him the fruit of your lips. Because you're not going to leave this place the same way. You're not going to leave this altar the same way. You're not going to go home the same way. Your household will not be the same way. Your job won't be the same way. not going to belabor the time with announcements, but y'all know we don't have a, we only have one given moment in the life of our church. You're free to give us any time. Listen, that is a part of worship. Come on, what God just did for us, we can never repay for what he just did for us, where he's taking us. Woo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just want to go ahead and share what God has given me to share today. Excuse me while I try to keep myself together. If you can turn your attention to Matthew, the 16th chapter, starting at the 13th verse. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. 
You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. For the brief moment I'm going to be before you, I want to talk to us about this. Share on the topic of, can I build on you? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this moment of sharing. We ask that you be the voice that speaks, and we will be the ears that hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a lot of times for, for me, I know Pastor Carl always says that he doesn't study for sermons. He studies, you know, for his devotion and God just gives him what to say. And a lot of times for me as I'm reading or I'm listening to certain things, and every so often just, you know, a text will pop in my mind, but it will sit. When I hear it, it'll sit. And I don't know why, but it'll just sit. And so I'll take the time to go and I'll read it so that I can sit in it. It'll sit in me first, but then I'll go sit in the Word to kind of see what it is that God is saying. And so I heard this scripture, um, who do men say that I am? And I went on, you know, just thinking about it further. And when Jesus told Peter that upon him, he was going to build his church. And I heard Holy Spirit ask me, can I build on you? And I'm saying, well, you know, I don't know. Because I don't even know what that really means. Can I build on you? You know, I felt like the prophet that's how, Lord, you know, I don't. You know, and so I went back to the text. So I said, let me, let me look back. Because for Jesus to say to Peter, upon, upon you, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Jesus must have saw something in Peter that said, I can build on you. And I had to ask myself, I had to really sit down and say, okay, can God build on me? Do I have what Peter had for God to say, can I build on you? And I'm not going to keep us long, so we're going to just go ahead into these points. Because, and the first thing that I saw in the text was that for God to build on us, we got to release our past. Because the first question that he asked, who do men say that I am? And what did they say? Elijah, some say John, some say Jeremiah, everybody in the past. And sometimes we do the same thing. Because how, how could it have been, how could Jesus have been John the Baptist? How could he have been Elijah? How could he have been Jeremiah? They were dead. And that's what we do. We hold on to dead stuff. Dead people. In our lives. And we just talked about it. I don't know what. So I, clearly, God already knew. He was ahead of the sermon. Because we hold on to dead stuff. And maybe he just want to explain to us what he just did. Because he want to build on us. And he wanted us to go ahead and let go of what's dead. I ain't even going to take my time with him. Be quick about it. Because we hold on to dead things and dead people that keep us from moving forward. And guess what? They keep us from seeing who Jesus really is. They keep us from seeing who God really is in our lives. And we try to make excuses for him, right? But you know, God, it's okay. He ain't that bad. She ain't that bad. We make excuses for keeping them in our lives. Just like these people. And, that, and that's why these people couldn't even see. They couldn't even, their mind couldn't even conceptualize a new revelation of who Jesus was. Because all they knew is what had been before him. What had been in the past. And sometimes we just can't separate from our past. Even personally. Some stuff that we just, I, we know what we did. We know what we've been through. We know what people have done to us, and we can't separate that. To walk in our newness, to see Jesus new, to see him newly in our lives, even in our, my, my relationship. 
I wanted things to be like they used to be when we first got together. And it kept me stuck in my relationship because I'm always back here. Be this. Be this. Be what you used to be. And maybe he can't be what he used to be because that don't serve us in the future. But it kept me stuck in my past. And it kept me stuck in my relationship. I can't move forward to the newness of what God wants to bring into my relationship because I want him to be who he used to be back here. And that might not have been good for me. It made me feel good. It was comfortable for me. It was what I liked. But if God is going to move us into newness, we got to be willing to let go of the stuff that used to be and separate ourselves from that and accept the newness that, that he's trying to bring into our lives. So the first thing we have to do is release our past. But the next thing we have to do is renounce perception. Verse 15 because when Jesus asked, who do they say I am? But then he got it personal. But who do you say I am? Now, when he asked, who do they say I am? Everybody had an answer. It said, they all started saying, you're this, you're that. But when he asked, who do you say I am? And but one had an answer. That meant that everybody else was believing like everybody else. Everybody else had the same perceptions as everybody else. But only one had a true revelation of who he is. And sometimes we are here because of what we've been told. We're here because grandma said, this is who Jesus is. We're here because mama said, this is who Jesus is. And we, not, we have not met him for ourselves. We have not had a true revelation of who he is. We perceive, but we don't know. We perceive who he is. Not too long ago, <laughs> you know, a couple of people had a, had a uh, call, Pastor Carl, for a meeting, and they wanted to share their insight on what the Mount Suffolk should be doing. I said a couple of people wanted to meet with Pastor Carl to share what they thought the Mount Suffolk should be doing. And they said, and I, I guess I hope you don't mind me telling it because I'm going to tell it. But <laughs> they told him, they said, you know, I think you're just kind of gimmicky, Pastor Carl. You know, you're just throwing gimmicks out there trying to get people in the kingdom. And I thought, and I don't know whether some of y'all saw my Facebook post the other day. One of my hashtags was, stop saying what Jesus said if you're not going to do what he did. Because you're saying it's gimmicky for me to share something with someone, to give somebody something, give them a gift card, give them groceries. You call it gimmicks. Well, when I look at my Bible, Jesus fed people before he ever told them anything. When I look at my Bible, Jesus always met the need before he fed them words. Because he understood there are some barriers I got to cross first to even get you to even trust that I have your best interest at heart so that I can trust me with the word. But because we've been taught that ain't what church look like. That ain't what church do. It's what Jesus did. Build your church, God. And if that means building it from the ground up, if it means tearing up tradition, if it means tearing up what church used to look like so it can look like what the church is supposed to look like, build your church, God. But we got to renounce perception, what we think. We think this is what Jesus said, but what did he really say? We think this is what Jesus did, but what did he really do? Because it might not look what, what you think it looked like. That's why he couldn't be Jesus. He had to be John. He had to be Jeremiah. This is what we know. This is what we're safe with. This was comfortable for us. I can recognize that. I don't recognize this. Jesus came looking like a lawbreaker. Doing what, he, what, what they said he wasn't supposed to do. What is the harm in healing a man? Even if it happens on the Sabbath. What is Jesus look like for real and not what we perceive him to look like if we going to let him build on us we got to drop it 
drop it. Drop that past. Drop those perceptions. Those things that are not him. But we perceive they are because they told us this is what it looks like. They've been trying to show us this, this is what Jesus looked like. But ain't but one way to know what he looked like. Study him. Study him. And that brings me to my third point. You have to receive a revelation. Peter received a revelation of who he was. Peter knew who Jesus was because he studied Jesus. He studied him. If you read the text, if you read the Gospels, Peter was always asking questions. The rest of the disciples were just listening. Okay, Jesus, all right, God, we hear you. And Peter said, well, what that mean? What you mean by that? So are you saying, Jesus, that he always asked questions because he wanted to know who Jesus was? And some of us, it's clear we don't want to know who he is because we're not asking questions. We're not studying for ourselves. We'll listen to what Pastor Carl said, go out here and say it, and then if it contradict what we heard uh, such and such on YouTube say, well, maybe that ain't what... But do you study Jesus for yourself? The problem with the church today while we are in so much dysfunction is because we're not following Jesus. We are following tradition. We are following people's perception of what the word says. And we are not following what Jesus said and what he did. It's clear. Because we reject people all the time. Tell people they're going to hell all the time. I've never seen Jesus do it. You show it to me in the text. I've seen him say that the preachers were going, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, but I never saw him say the woman that with adultery was going. I never saw him say that the woman at the well was going. Stop saying what Jesus said because you don't do what he did. Receive a revelation for yourself. I joke all the time. I say, I got a PhD in Pastor Carl. I can be him. But it's because I study him. I listen to him. I ask him questions. So why, when you said that, why did you do that? What were you thinking? How did you process that? Because I want to know. I want to know him. And that's how now when, he, when his face is a little off, people might not notice and I'm like, well, uh, something, what? What's going on? Because I study him. And that's how we're supposed to be. I want an intimate relationship with him. And we say we want an inter intimate relationship with Christ. We got to study him the same way. Well, Jesus, why you say that to that woman? Well, why you didn't? Because you know we would have told her, you got to get out of the church. You can't. Why you didn't? Find out why. Who your Savior is. He yours, right? Y'all say, you say you belong to him and he belong to you. Then who is he? Get that revelation for yourself. And be careful. Be careful. Trying to build with somebody who love you. I mean, who you love. Build with somebody who love you. Because John said, I'm the disciple who Jesus loved. But Jesus built with the disciple that loved him. Because the Bible shows us at won't nobody going to play with Jesus around Peter. Nobody. Not even Jesus. Because when Jesus said, I got to die, Peter said, uh-uh, hold on, let me talk to you. That ain't going to happen. You ain't going to do that. Peter loved Jesus. If he didn't love him, he wouldn't have invested all of that time listening and asking and questioning. He wouldn't have fought for him. He loved Jesus. And Jesus didn't build his church with John, whom he loved. And we want to build with people who we love. I just love them. We want to build life with people who we love, but don't love us. You better find you somebody who loves you to build with, because then you can trust them. Peter always wanted to get close to Jesus. Every time, when, when, when the storm was on the ocean, who, came, who said Jesus called me? I know it's storming, but if you're on the storm, I'm coming with you. Call me. The one who Jesus loved was in the boat like, all right, Peter. When Jesus was in the grave, John came. But he stood outside. 
And Peter said, uh-uh, where Jesus at? But Jesus loved John. But Peter, he loved Jesus. Because he had a revelation. This ain't no imitation, baby. This ain't John coming back. This ain't Jeremiah coming back. This ain't no imitation. This, this, this came from God. It's clear. This God doing. I know who he is. Get a personal revelation so that God can build on you. And the last thing is that we have to be ready. Y'all hold on tight. We got to be ready for resistance. Because verse 18 and 19, he said, I'm going to build on you, Peter. And I'm going to build on you because you are rock. And the translation of rock meant firm. Peter was firm in who God was. Wasn't going to shake him. Then he had his little moment when things got tight. When he denied Peter. But he came back strong. He was firm in who Jesus was. And because of this, Jesus said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. But the kingdom is going to come. It, 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 the keys don't come without resistance. And you ain't going to be no gatekeeper to the kingdom if you shake him. You got to be firm. Because the enemy going to come. It says that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not conquer it. But that means that the gates of hell are going to try. And Jesus gave Peter the authority because he was firm enough to know that you know what? Even though the enemy is going to try it, I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to hold the gate. Ain't nobody, I got the key. And ain't nobody getting in be, 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 before me. Ain't nobody getting in between me and the gate. I hold the key. And whatever I shut up in heaven, going to be shut up here. And whatever I open up, going to be opened up here. And some of us wonder why we don't have no spiritual authority. Because you ain't got no revelation. Because you're still holding on to stuff that you need to let go. Because your perception is not right. You've not took the time to study who he is. And God said you're shaky. You can't hold no keys. Your relationship with me is shaky. But we can show it up. We can show it up. I think about what's happening. You know, the shooting that happened at Walmart. And then you got, less than a week later, right down the street, they starting a Satan club at the school. You don't see Satan trying to take tourist horn on the same road? And we happened to be in Sight Pastor's retreat yesterday, and Bishop was sharing a revelation that Kimberly had because she doubled on my revelation. I said, okay, clearly the enemy trying to take territory because he started at one end of the street, and he working his way down the, the, the rest of the street. But what is the street called? a revelation but if you ain't got no keys how can you fight on battlefield and we sitting back here and say God you got to do something Lord you, you got to move Lord you got to do something I gave you the keys I'm trying to get keys to you I said that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church you are the church I know the gates of hell ain't going to prevail against me. I'm God. But he's trying to prevail where you are. Can I give you keys to shut it up on earth because you have shut it up in heaven? To open up peace on earth because you have opened it in heaven. I'm trying to give you keys. And you asking me, God, fix it. Can I build on you? Because if, if you're not clear about what has happened with COVID, the church has been shaken. If you are not clear, that's why this room ain't filled because the church has been scattered. And God is trying to see who can I build on? Because he's building his church again. He is building his church again. Who can I build with? And I'm sorry to tell you that some of the people you don't see anymore because God said, I can.
Because I'm going to just tell you, you were created for, on purpose for purpose. And when purpose has expired, God said, who can I build on? Can I build on you? Do you know me? Can I give you the keys to everything that I have? Because I can trust you that if I say open it, you'll open it. Can I give you the keys? Because I trust you that if I say close it, you'll close it. Can I give you keys? That when something happens, you won't run in the house and shut the door and stop worshiping. Stop touching people. Because I wonder, we were locked up and we, when people cough right now, we still look at them like, what you? But Jesus was touching lepers and lived. Can I give you keys that you ain't going to run and hide? When trouble comes, the battlefield, are you going to Walmart again? When Satan Club comes to the thing, are you going to stand up? You know what? Y'all pray. I'm going to pray. Y'all going to have a club? I'm going to have a club. We all going to the club. We scared. Oh, God, what are we going to do now? Oh, Lord, our children. You the answer. What you cover, you think the enemy can control what you cover? You carry the king of all kings. I want to give you the keys. I want to give you the authority. I want to build my church on you. I want to manifest healing again. I want to manifest deliverance again. That ain't a thing of the past. I want to do it again. Through you. Through you. Through you. I want you to be able to lay your hands and the sick recover. Oh my God, the hospitals are so overcrowded. We don't have enough room for this because the church don't have no key. And I get it. I get it. Peter get it. When it got tight, he said, I don't know him. I said, I don't know him. Okay, I'm about to cuss. I don't know him. I get it. It gets scary. But then Peter said, you know what? No, no, no. I know who he is. I know who he is. And when he called, I'm coming back. When Jesus said, go get Peter. Bring him back. And Peter said, I'm back. I ain't going to let the embarrassment and the shame because I know who you are. I know who you are. And you can build on me. I ain't forget. You can build on me. You can trust me. And when Peter broke out the gate, daily souls were added. And God wants to build his church on the remnant so that daily souls can be added. And I believe he's asking us today, just like he asked me in my bathroom. I know now, God, you can build on me. And sometimes I ain't sure. I promise you today, even with this word, I won't show. And I sat there and I watched praise and worship. And I sat there and I heard Holy Spirit say, I'm, I'm going to need you to go on that stage. And I said, praise and worship is going on, God. This is not what church does. This, is, this, this ain't, that's not what you do in church, God. Can I build on you? three invitations God wants to build on us all today and he's already started don't cancel the work 
Don't cancel the work. Don't go back. Don't look at don't look back at the past. When you go home this week, you wash yourself in the word. And you find out what Jesus said. You ask Holy Spirit, God, show me who you say I am in the kingdom. Black Panther ain't the only superhero. You know we love our Wakanda forever. How about the kingdom forever? He called us all to be warriors in the kingdom. Find out who he is. Get that revelation of who he is and who you are in him. You are loved by him. And if you don't know him today, we want to give you that opportunity to join the baddest kingdom there is and ever was that was established before time. The kingdom that never comes to an end. This is your opportunity to accept Jesus as your savior. Rededicate your life to Christ. Come on back, join up again with him. You might have quit. You might have got shaky and said, you know what, I don't know about this. And God has said, no, I need you. There's a battle going on. And I need to hand out some keys. Rededicate your life. And maybe you don't have a church home and you believe that this is the place where you hear from God, you experience God, you see God. We give you the opportunity today to join with us. Savior, rededicate your life to Christ. Or become part of this fellowship. Just walk down the aisle and either one of these beautiful ladies will greet you. As Pastor Carl say, I'm not I'm out of time, but I'm not out of words. Before we do our benediction, just a reminder, we got the Women's Expo outside. Come see what these awesome ladies have. Support them and what they're doing in the kingdom, because that is kingdom service. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. To the only wise God be glory, majesty, dominion, and power. We call you blessed in the city, blessed in the fields, blessed when you come, and blessed when you go. In Jesus' name, amen.